Welcome back to Alternative Realities. I'm David Kelly, Chief Global Strategist here at JP Morgan Asset Management. Today we're going to be looking at alternatives through the lens of an individual investor. Historically, these asset classes have been the domain of institutional capital, but the evolution of alternative investment vehicles has made them more accessible. Not only do individuals have more access to alternatives, they also have a greater need, as the traditional 60-40 portfolio faces challenges like elevated valuations, positive stock bond correlations, and negative real yield. Additionally, as companies are staying private for longer, alternatives are increasingly necessary to access these high growth areas of the market. I'm grateful today to be joined by Christian Clergis, the head of alternative investments for JP Morgan's private bank, to discuss all of these themes. Her team manages $180 billion of private wealth invested across a wide variety of alternative solutions, giving her unique insight into the evolution of this market. Well, Kristen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So can you walk a little uh, us through the sort of path we took to get here? I mean, it used to be that alternatives were really seen as only being for institutional portfolios. So what has changed and why should individual investors think about alternatives today? That's a good question. I, it's funny. Within our organization, we've been allocating and our clients on from a private banking perspective or an individual perspective, as we shall talk about in this sort of conversation, have been investing for over 30 years. I would say, though, allocations have grown similar to how institutions have, have grown. They've just started from a lower uh, starting point, but also the access points have changed. I'm sure we'll get more into that. I do think structurally uh, the ways companies fund themselves have changed. You know, it used to be that you could just go issue a bond or go out to the get a bank loan. Now the world of private credit has increased massively and it's giving individual investors another option for uh, earning income in their portfolio. On the equity side, it's it's trends like, you know, the innovation economy and what private tech companies are staying private longer and people want access to innovation. So it's it's both structurally what's changing, but also the access points for how people um, can put in their portfolio. And then I think in more recent years, uh, even over the last decade, as correlations between stocks and bonds have risen, I think people want diversifiers in the portfolio. So they're thinking more holistically, similar to how institutions sort of think about using alternatives within their It's an alternative to something else. And that's definitely what we've seen on the individual side as well. So so I guess to summarize, uh, you know, more urgency about making sure you have some alternatives here, given what a 60-40 portfolio has done, uh, more opportunity set, the opportunity set in alternatives is growing. And then really more access yeah, as the industry has responded. So, um, hold on. I mean, someone told but, me there's ten times more private companies in public, and that always mm-hmm. sort of sticks with me. I'm just actually getting access to the economy. So, uh, one pushback we often get on alternatives is liquidity. So, um, given the liquidity issue, can you give us an idea about the minimum amount an investor could put into an alternative stra- strategy, and how should they think about sizing their liquidity needs? It's a good question. I- I would say most of our families, the way that we always start by thinking about it is in the worst crisis ever, if you didn't take all of your money out of public markets, there's probably a piece. Most think of the starting point as sort of 10%. Um, and we'll talk more specifically about as the portfolio grows and your time horizon grows, the higher the allocation tends to be, again, similar to institutions. But I would say most start at 10% because by not investing in alternatives, you might be giving up returns for liquidity that you don't need. Um, and so what I would say, it's, it always starts with a goal. What are you trying to achieve in your portfolio? Higher income, higher returns, a, high, a longer time horizon. Uh, I would say on average, though, most of our clients, those that participate in alternatives with us are just over 20% allocated. That's a mix underlying in terms of being diversified across strategies, uh, vintage years, geographies. And that's a lot of the, the building blocks that we help them discuss. Uh, but I would say, you know, our, our largest families, we just put out a family office report, too, that said, of our top 200 families that were surveyed, their average allocations to alternatives more broadly was just over 45%. 17% was in private equity funds, 15% in real estate and so on. But it is a pretty wide range and it really starts with understanding the goals of a portfolio. But I would say it it, it you know mostly starts at around between that 10 to 20%. And then you can build as you go. It's always harder to, to pull back. And so it's easier to build uh, from a, a good starting point. Um, another sort of unique or, or at least very different aspect uh, of investing alternatives is just the the huge dispersion in manager performance. Uh, what do you say to your clients about how to select the right manager in each asset class with, within alternatives? Well, it is funny because there 
if looking at a track record was as easy as just picking managers on a go for it basis, you wouldn't need folks like us. And we wouldn't have over a hundred investment professionals that are just focused on identifying it. And I remember when I became dedicated to alternatives just over a decade ago, there were maybe 1400 people raising a private equity fund at the time. There were about 9,000 hedge funds at the time. Now there's over 14,000 people raising capital on the private side in a given year. And there's over 30,000 hedge funds. So there, there's plenty of choice. And you're right, manager dispersion is one of the most important things to understand within this part of the portfolio. And there's various reports out from Cambridge and, and Frequent and, and Burgess and others that show that that dispersion within alternatives for private equity more broadly is over 17% net annualized. So the difference between a good and a not so good manager might make that illiquidity not worth it. And I would say, uh, you know, as it's becoming more and more difficult, the basic starting point is figuring out your strategic asset allocation and then figuring out how you build those building blocks. So for example, if you want to invest in drawdown space, don't allocate all in year one, allocate over three to five vintage years, diversify by sector, geography, and manager. And I know that you know, alternatives is a huge space um, in terms of different and very, very different types of assets. Which, for you know, high net worth individuals, what are the asset classes within alternatives that are most popular right now? Well, I would say after a lot of, I would say most of our clients are getting back to the basics of having that core, you know, private equity exposure in the portfolio. So their portfolios tend to be similar to actually how we manage portfolios. I just did an analysis that looked at the assets by strategy. Then we can talk more specifically about recent trends, but it is between 55 and 65% in just core private equity strategies. It's you know anywhere from 10 to 20% in private debt oriented solutions. Higher if many of our clients want to allocate to things like special situations or distress credit oriented um, sub strategies. Uh, it's about 15 to 25% in real assets. Those can include areas like infrastructure. Um, those can include things like real estate. And then I would say that it's a smaller piece, even though it gets a lot of uh, acknowledgement is the venture and growth community. That still sort of is remaining under 15 to 20% of most portfolios. But I would say more recently, our clients are looking for less correlated return streams. And so they're leaning into areas like infrastructure or transportation, uh, some of those subsectors, and then even hedge funds. Hedge funds are not an industry, you know, they're an industry, not an asset class, but figuring out ways in which you can find less correlated return streams in your portfolio as volatility increases from the recent past. Hedge funds have also played a, a role unlike they have in the last 15 years. We've, we're seeing many more flows from our clients into an area like that. Are there any alternative asset classes which are just too niche for, for our individual investors? Too niche. Uh, I would say it. as long as you have your meat and potatoes, I'm always happy with clients exploring some of those other niche areas. There are plenty of niche things that are always talked about. I've been you know, I've looked at everything from art investments to sports teams. Uh, and I would say as more and more uh, of these uh, companies are sort of developing from these areas or, or areas like within sports, it's interesting because the media rights associated with it. But a lot of those um, focus areas, even if you look at some of the best alternative managers in the world are not a dedicated portion of it, they're a piece of it, similar to what we think of our clients' portfolios. Uh, those are some of the more niche areas, I would say, more recently, or even areas like timber. You know, a lot of people didn't know much about timber investing up until the most recent years. And it's a, a place that even JP Morgan um, had invested behind as we made an acquisition of that space. But um, I would say, uh, or healthcare royalties, or some of these areas that are, are more niche. I would say the places that are niche, but also gaining traction are those that can provide both less correlated return streams, maybe an income, and then some equity upside. Those are some areas that were... Um, that's sort of the the golden uh, spot within a portfolio that many of our clients are focusing more of their attention on after exactly. they can build the core pieces. So they they may be unusual, but they have to have some basic characteristics which help help people in terms of their overall portfolio goals. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do think even in that most recent family office report we did, you know, venture capital, which is often where you find some of these very innovative ideas, was still less than five percent of portfolios from our most sophisticated family offices. So it just shows you that there's plenty to talk about, but when it comes to actually allocating dollars, it's a smaller piece of the portfolio. So keeping that in perspective, I think is always important, uh, but it's certainly something we look at. Um, 
In addition to the issues of money getting locked up, I guess, in, in private equity for a while, there are always sort of cash flow management issues in, in private equity. Can, can you walk us through what an investor getting into private equity should expect in terms of cash flow? Yeah, it's one of the hardest things to build a private equity workflow if you're going to use traditional drawdown funds. What I mean by that is you commit to a fund manager and a blind pool portfolio. They go out to invest over a three to six year investment period. They look to sell those assets in the following three to six years. And what we're finding uh, more and more is that if you're allocating that way, you not only need to commit every vintage year for a number of years to get that diversification, because if you only invested, for example, in 2005, 2006, 2007, and you were trying to sell your portfolios or your companies in 2008, 2009, 2010, it was a pretty tough period for your portfolio. So what I would say is when it comes to thinking through cash flows, we went out there to sort of scour the industry to see who can help us build it. And we've actually just built our own proprietary model on this over decades of experience. But the, the thing that I would say is if folks have a harder time understanding how to manage these cash flows, which even the most sophisticated investors do, there is sort of this rise of the evergreen funds, these perpetual funds where you fund it up front. You're going to sort of give the, the power of investing the uninvested cash to the manager that you commit to. Uh, you're going to accept a lower return and maybe some cash drag associated with it. But what's fascinating is because of the uncertainty that often comes with committing to private equity or private debt or private real estate vehicles, you might end up with a higher multiple over time. Multiple of money over time matters. That's what we always say is cash back in your pocket. Uh, so what I would say is thinking through some solutions that are evergreen in nature, as that has increased in the industry, these private uh, market evergreen portfolios, that's certainly a place that I think in a year from now, the choice will probably double in size given the conversations I'm having across the industry and folks trying to, the general partners trying to solve that need for investors. So you can, you can lose some degree of perhaps uh, upside in terms of total return, but you can get a much more predictable cash flow and a much more predictable exposure to private equity that way. Yeah. And I think as long, and it's, it's been more um, attractive and income oriented solutions and things like private credit or private credit or infrastructure, because they might have their own sort of mixing and matching of cash flows, inflows and outflows over time, as you think about their own liquidity. But when you have an income orientation to it, it sort of can withstand various points in time and can help withstand some of the market dynamics of, of a product flows uh, to actually help continue to compound your portfolio. Uh, okay. And fi finally, um, to sort of wrap this up, can you talk to us a little bit about the way your clients are using alternatives to address some of the secular team themes we've got in March today? Things like AI, the energy transition, you know, structurally higher inflation, the, the, all, all of these things that come to mind, but you know, wh whatever you're seeing there. A lot of our favorite things, you know, even though we start with the meat and potatoes of having poor exposures and we sort of add sector specialists and geographic uh, sort of tilts in the portfolio, I would say you've listed a couple of the sort of more popular uh, conversations that we've been having lately, but also places that we've been thinking about portfolios. So when it comes to artificial intelligence, we actually think near term uh, to the extent that clients want exposure, we're investing through public markets. Uh, from that point, we might have some private market structures, but they're still investing in the public markets. We're mindful that when you look um, at the private markets in the growth equity market in Q1 alone, the valuations have risen by over 61%. Uh, and so we're just very mindful of that right now, even though we still think that there's some true breakouts that are taking place. So I would say that would be my, my comment in artificial intelligence. In energy transition, it's certainly a place that our clients are getting access to through infrastructure allocations, um, a lot of the picks and shovels behind both artificial intelligence might come through energy. So that's also sort of the double whammy within um, the energy transition is finding the picks and shovels, power generation, batteries, transportation. A lot of those are coming more in, um, in real assets, I would say more broadly allocation of portfolios, which have been up in our client portfolios about a 6% allocation in the last five years. Um, and then your point on you know higher inflation I would say as we think about just rates overall, whether or not they stay kind of, even if they come down a little bit near term or how, where they end up, I would say over the medium to longer term, private credit continues to be a place in which our clients are allocating portfolios there um, as they think about higher inflation. So a couple different ways that we think about it, but I would say, again, it's figuring out um, goals of the portfolio, 
maybe it's higher income, maybe it's higher returns or a balance between the two, knowing that you can withstand illiquidity over time. It's figuring out how do you get your core allocations to managers that we think can achieve first, second quartile type returns. And then it's figuring out within that, how much exposure do you have to some of these secular themes and where you might want to overweight a more niche fund to your point and whether that access comes in the liquid or the illiquid market. So plenty of great conversations uh, to be had right now as, as clients think about the traditional 60, 40 may or may not be working for them and, and where you sort of can think about alternatives as a piece of that. Excellent. Well, so thank you so much, Kristen, for joining us here on Alternative Realities. Anytime. Talk soon.